I, I admittedly chose perhaps an overly uh, ambitious uh, title here, which is, like Nick said, why you came. Um, <laughs> but uh, but what, what I really want to talk about, to sort of like put it in a nutshell, is, is the conundrum of why it is that humans, uh, all you hum humans out there, have so much more cognitive power than animals, despite the fact that the organization uh, of the human brain is very similar to the organization of the brain, brains of, of other primates. Uh, so wh what, what gives us this huge increase in cognitive power? We're sitting in a, in, a, in a building that people made, and we're using technology here with millions of parts in it, or billions of parts in it, that, that people made. What, what, what is the difference? Because our, as, as you'll see in the talk, our brains are quite similar. Now, scientists you know, have long been interested in studying animal minds to try to figure out how, how the, human mind, uh, uh, the human mind works. And so I'm going to start off talking uh, about the organization, particularly of visual areas uh, in primates. And before I do that, I want to sort of introduce uh, an older theory uh, of how the brain works. Now, why do we want to talk uh, about something that was this is, this is about a 500-year-old picture, since we know a lot more about the brain now. Uh, one reason to, to look back uh, in time is to sort of look at some of the, the presuppositions that people have about how the brain works. And scientists are people, too, and they bring those presuppositions to their, uh, to their work. And it's important to, to, to realize that when we're thinking about complicated topics like this, that we often have certain additional things in addition to the data that, that influence the way that, we, the way that we think about it. And this, this old theory, I mean, it actually dates back to just, uh, just after the, uh, to maybe 400 AD, but this, this picture from, uh, from around the Renaissance shows all the different sensory modalities. So this is the tongue and, and the nose uh, and the ears and the eyes uh, coming together at the front of the brain um, in what was called at the time uh, the sensus communis, the common sense. And that's actually the meaning of the word common, that, that's where the meaning of the word comes from. It's sort of data that's presented to the mind's eye. So you notice all the modalities get all mixed together and presented to the mind's eye, and then in, in the ventricles. Now, in, in the early days, people didn't think that, that the actual sort of tissue of the brain was where thought was going on, because thought is kind of airy. And so they sort of imagined that thought was, it was kind of like the, um, the dilithium crystals in the, you know, the Star Trek, uh, Star Trek drive. It was like some sort of like diaphanous blue material that was floating around in the ventricles, which sort of seems more like uh, what, thought, what thought seems like. But if you notice, this, this early cognitive theory of how the brain works has basically all of the sensations coming here, and then you have imagination, sort of like visualization over here, and then this is cognition. See, it's, it's, it's an early cognitive science department. So there's, there's cognition and estimation, that means sort of like doing math, and then memory back here, and memory is what was supposed to be in the driest ventricle, which was the best suited for storing memories for a long time. <laughs> now, I, <clears throat> I, we, we put this picture up and say, you know, obviously we know a lot more about the brain, but it turns out that some of the themes introduced here of sort of sensation, you know, perception, cognition, and memory uh, haven't gone away. What I would like to uh, introduce to you is some data that suggests that this picture is really fundamentally wrong. Um, now, when we study the brain, one of the parts that we study a lot is the cortex, because that's especially grown a lot in, in humans compared to other animals. Um, and what are the animals, you know, so where did sort of the good visual system that primates have and humans have come from? Human visual system is much better than the visual system of a dog, for instance. A dog would be legally blind uh, by the standard, uh, standard measures. They can see, you know, they can still see, but their, their vision is nowhere near as good as a, a primate like a monkey or, or ourselves. Or even something like this, a bush baby. Uh, these are small little, uh, little primates, early primitive primates. Uh, so just going way back, what caused the visual system to get good? It turns out that we inherit our good visual system from these guys who, who basically evolved it for the purpose of eating bugs at night. 
Now, that's, that's not something that, uh, that you normally associate with the visual system, but uh, uh, here's another uh, set of primates. These are little tarsiers. And you can see uh, they have quite a small brain. Their whole brain would sort of fit into the eye of a human, uh, quite a small brain. Uh, of course, some of the primates that we're especially interested in are uh, chimpanzees. This is, this is a bonobo, uh, so-called pygmy chimpanzee. Uh, that's actually Kanzi, and, and Kanzi obviously has a brain that's much more like a human brain uh, than, uh, than those very small primates. And among other things, Kanzi has a brain um, that is larger, considerably larger than a monkey, not as big as us, but considerably larger than a monkey, and you notice it's quite folded, and you've probably often heard that sort of folding is good, and we have lots of folds. Uh, but uh, size, size isn't everything. This is, this is a human brain down here. And, and this, is, this is a killer whale brain, sort of like a Shamu brain. So a Shamu brain is enormously bigger than a human brain. It's enormously more folded. So it's just not size, because remember sort of who's training who at SeaWorld. <laughs> So it's just not size and it's just not fold. So there's some, there, there's some additional power that we have in our brain. And so that's really the, what we want to figure out. But before we do that, let's uh, sort of take a tour through some parts of the, of the visual system. So this is a small monkey. This is called an owl monkey for obvious reasons. It actually lives at night and uh, it sort of looks like an owl, which is why it's called an owl monkey. Interestingly, there's the, the, the father owl monkey. The baby rides around on the father. These are monogamous monkeys. And uh, as soon as the baby is born, it goes on dad and stays on dad. The mother pries it loose to nurse it occasionally. Uh, see, sort of a Californian kind of monkeys. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the, <clears throat> the owl monkey has a relatively flat brain. And it turns out, you, if you're very careful, it's possible to, to remove the, the, the cortex from the white matter, and I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit, but I, I'll just start off with this flattened picture and stain it, uh, and then actually look down on the cortex, and you can see some of the different areas in the cortex. In particular, you can see there's a, there's a, a subtle line running right here, and this is, this is one area, the first visual area. And you can also see like a little dark area right here. This, this is another visual area in the brain that's particularly interested in, in motion, in, in moving, uh, moving objects. And there's other areas down here that are involved in sort of uh, detecting the shape of objects and the color of objects and whether or not something is a face. Now, as a result of uh, many experiments, there's, uh, there's about uh, 15 years in between these two slides. Here we have a, 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 a summary of that, of that previous slide uh, except just uh, in, in color, showing you all these different series of, uh, of areas that, that we've identified in, in primate brains. These are all visual areas, and if you actually look at the total coverage of the cortex, it's almost 50% of the cortex consists of areas devoted to one or another aspect of, of vision. Now, the problem with studying essentially finding all those areas. There's quite a few of them. There's probably on the order of about 30 that we know about right now. Uh, the problem of, of finding those areas in humans is made much more complex by the, by the problem that, we, that I mentioned at the beginning about the cortex being very folded. So if, if, you look at, uh, if you look at the cortex here, this is the gray matter, hence the name of the series. So that, that, that's the very gray matter surface there. Uh, what, what this is is a picture of a, of a right hemisphere of a human uh, an autopsy specimen that's been, that's been cut so you can see into the inside of it. And that's the, this is the white matter where all the connections that go from one part of the cortex to some other part of the cortex uh, run. So you can see it's a huge number of fibers. This is a very dense structure. Every square millimeter of this contains about one gigabyte of connections. Incredibly dense. It's denser than any of the, the densest memory chips that we can currently make. So it's, it's quite a formidable machine, even in something like a, like a rat. Now, but the problem is, uh, <clears throat> it's all folded up. And we know that along the, 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 the ed edge of the surface here, you know, maybe like, say, starting halfway here and going partly down into one of those 
those little sulci or crevices there, there are these different areas. But it, it's actually quite hard to study because it's so folded up. And so um, the first thing I did was I thought I would flatten it. And so I showed this once to my former advisor back at the University of Chicago, Phil Ulinski, and he said, all you've showed me, Marty, is that you can turn the brain into liver. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> so you may wonder, like, what's all these marks on here? Well, the problem was that once you flatten it, it's pretty hard to tell where, where stuff used to be. So I painted it. <laughs> And I even put like little letters there on it so I could see, you know, where different parts were. Uh, and then they gave me a computer. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, uh, actually I had a computer back then. But uh, uh, anyway, part of the problem is that uh, if we're going to sort of map these areas, especially if we're going to look for the actual activity in these areas, uh, we would, uh, we would like to do it on somebody who's still alive. This is actually uh, a scan of my wife, Claudia, who is still very much alive. Uh, and this was done in, a, in an MRI machine, which allows you to make uh, virtual slices of the brain. And you can actually see, here's that same gray matter. It's sort of like really dark gray now, uh, running along the surface. And then here's all the white matter uh, in between. Uh, now, with the help of uh, some very smart uh, graduate students, uh, we wrote some computer programs to actually get the computer to recover that cortical surface. And it turns out it's extremely difficult uh, to get, your visual system is better than you think. Uh, your visual system can look at that co folded cortex and easily see it's a connected surface. Getting the computer to recognize that is, is, quite, a, is quite a job. But we managed to do this so that we can actually get the computer to reconstruct this surface. And then once we reconstructed it, we could unfold it uh, and fold it back up again and fold it, <laughs> unfold it. But the, the important thing here about this uh, animation, hopefully nobody's getting seasick, is that, uh, is that you can see the folding pattern is, is relatively gentle. And, and part of the reason for this is that the, the brain starts off as sort of like a, like a smooth surface in the, in the, in the fetus. And then as, as, the, as the brain grows, it kind of runs into the skull. And at some point, it starts sort of being thrown into folds. But those folds are sort of relatively gentle, and so it's relatively straightforward to inflate it. If you want to be a little more violent, you can actually uh, you can cut through the computer representation of the brain and let it completely flatten into a pelt. So this is, this is the right hemisphere completely flattened into sort of like a brain, brain pelt. It's about the size of a, of a medium pizza for each hemisphere. <laughs> uh, so as a result of uh, sort of putting all our friends and graduate students and ourselves and, uh, and all their, their uh, associates uh, into the scanner, we were able to actually reconstruct the brains of a large number of different people. This is the, the right hemisphere of a bunch of people, and there's their left hemisphere of a bunch of people. You can see they all look a little different. And that brings up a point trying to find a, 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 the difficulties of trying to sort of find the same point in one person's brain compared to another person's brain. And so I've done quite a bit of work on trying to sort of align brains. Uh, and so we have like the brain of, uh, I think this is an American up here and an Italian. No, no, sorry, that's a that's Norwegian and an Italian and <laughs> Portuguese, uh, Portuguese there. So um, what we can do is sort of inflate the brains. That's without stretching, just get rid of the folds. And, and then when the program was actually working, turn them into footballs, they're still different. Uh, and then sort of simplify the pattern so we can see the major folding pattern. And then we can actually stretch one into an alignment with another brain. So this is actually stretching an American into alignment with an Italian brain. Uh, <coughs> see, it's relatively gentle. Uh, and then once, uh, once, once we do that, then we can actually sort of like find more or less the same point across different brains. And this shows you just uh, uh, the, uh, the American brain sort of in the little red outline and then the sort of the orange outline and then the, the green and red is the target Italian brain. And you can see after we sort of morphed it into alignment, it sort of lines up all the major parts of the brain. Why do we need to do this? Well, if you look around and look at different people, their heads are different shapes. And that actually means their brains are different shapes, considerably different shapes. You can easily recognize somebody from, by looking at their brain. At least I can. <laughs> So once we did that, then we can sort of apply sort of a latitude and longitude coordinate system to the brain to, to kind of systematically 
collect data from different people and sort of see how it, how it matches up. Now, all of the things I talked about so far were uh, things having to do with the actual structure of the cortex. There's actually been a revolution in brain imaging which came about uh, in the early part of the 90s when some experimenters figured out how to, how to detect actual activity in the brain using an MRI machine. And the way this works is, um, if it, it turns out surprisingly that if you, if some part of your brain becomes active, even a very small part, just a millimeter or two across, what happens is it immediately demands more blood because your brain actually uses a substantial portion of the power output of your body. Your body doesn't put out too many watts. Your brain only uses like about, you know, like five watts. It's a quite a supercomputer that runs on only five watts. Uh, but that's still uh, quite a bit compared to the, the power used by the rest of the body. What does all this power go into? Well, it turns out any time you actually look at something, uh, like say just you're in a dark room and you see a little spot of light, that will cause a little spot of activity to appear. Instantly, within one or two seconds, the blood vessels will open up and more blood, oxygenated blood, will go to that spot. Now, the people who work with MRI magnets uh, figured out that deoxygenated blood, after the oxygen has been taken out, slightly disturbs the magnetic field. And, it's, and because of that, you can detect that slight disturbance in the magnetic field uh, in an MRI magnet. And this has really revolutionized brain imaging because it's allowed us to, uh, to for instance, scan people repeatedly because unlike, uh, unlike x-rays, the MRI machine is non-invasive and so we can scan people repeatedly, but also it allows us to to scan them with incredibly high resolution. So this is a close-up of the folded cortex. And with an MRI machine, you can basically, just a handful of these little squares that are about a millimeter across, you can record activity independently from all the other spots in the brain. So we have this extremely high resolution picture of activity in the brain. So I'd like, I'd like to sort of talk about some of, uh, some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, examples of data analysis of function in the brain, not just structure. So one of the things that, that I'm, I'm known for doing a lot, especially among people who are my friends and go on the magnet, is a mapping study, visual mapping study. So how does this work? So in this kind of experiment, you're lying in, in, in the magnet and you're looking at, this, at a screen which is right next to your face, pretty close to your face, and you're supposed to stare at that spot right in the middle of the screen for long periods of time. Uh, well, about eight minutes at a shot, although that's kind of a long time to stare at that little spot. Uh, but basically the way this works is if you stare at that spot and say there's a part of the brain that represents that part of visual space, what will happen is every once in a while, like about once a minute, it will get stimulated by all that, that, that flashing uh, checkerboard. And then a little bit later, you know, five seconds later, uh, it won't be stimulated. And so what you can do with that is look for regions that are sort of occasionally stimulated and then look for the delay in the stimulation and that will allow you to actually figure out essentially what part of the visual field is represented at each of tens of thousands of spots in the brain. So it allows you to actually, to actually map these representations in the brain. Now, in order to sort of make it easier to look at, we take the brain, sort of, that's the, the right hemisphere, we flip it around so you can see the, the midline part that's hidden in the middle of your head, and then tilt it a little bit, and then blow it up, and then snip off the back part, and flatten it all out. And so this is, that's, I'm gonna show you a picture that's all flattened out of some of these different visual areas. So here's an example of an animation of the activity that would happen on your brain or that actually did happen on this person's brain as that checkerboard sort of swept through the field. And so red indicates when the checkerboard was relatively high and blue is when it was sort of in the middle and green is when it was uh, down low. And what you can see is that any point in time, this little white animated stripe that's sort of like going from high to low uh, is actually, you, you can find there's like three or four or six or ten white stripes at any one point in time. So what that means is that anytime something happens out in the visual world, 
it's actually, it's actually copied into the brain and sort of like divided out into, as it turns out, probably 30 copies of that information uh, that, as I mentioned before, emphasize different aspects um, of the information, like for instance, the shape of a particular part of the visual world or, or the motion in the part, particular part of the visual world, somewhat ignoring the color, for instance, something like that. So there's, there's, there's this whole sort of like network of areas that are, that are coordinated and when we actually look at this data and compare it to data from, from monkeys, it looks actually quite similar. There's some slight differences in terms of some areas being slightly bigger, but the basic layout of the brain between uh, a human and a monkey, not even a chimpanzee, a monkey, which is less closely related to us than a chimpanzee, uh, is actually very similar to, uh, to the human brain. Uh, this is just a, an unlabeled summary diagram of some scans we did on one person showing two different kinds of visual areas. This is the yellow ones are areas that represent the world as a mirror image of the world and the blue represent it as not a mirror image of the world. That's just a convenient way to divide up the areas. And so you can see this patchwork of a very large number of different areas. This is the back of the, the, back of the brain right here and it's rotating around so that you're looking right at the back here and now you're looking at sort of the part that's inside and then that's tilting down to look at the, at the top here. And then also as it rotates around, you can, you can begin to see the underside of, of the brain right here. That's the underside. So now that's a relatively, a relatively kind of boring experiment. Like you're just staring at those darn checkerboards for an hour or two. It turns out that a lot of the brain uh, actually doesn't care too much about, about the checkerboards. And you actually have to do something where you're paying attention uh, to some part of the visual world. And by actually having people do a task where they pay attention to different parts of the world and try to remember, for instance, where there's, whether something is, is present or not, you can actually show that there are essentially maps of remembered locations. So nothing is actually at this location, but if you're remembering it, uh, and the location tends to be up in the visual field, a little part of your left hemisphere will become active just during the memory of a location of an object with no object actually being there. Of course, sometimes these scans don't work. Somebody gets a little sleepy in the magnet and they're not paying close attention. And then uh, <clears throat> sometimes we augment their pay if they, uh, <laughs> they have a little bit more activity in their brain. We also have a coffee maker at the, uh, at the uh, scanner center. It turns out if you drink coffee, that really sort of like makes your brain work a little better actually. <laughs> Um, now, that's still not a very hard, hard task, just remembering where an object used to be. So this is a much harder task. This one, you, you stare at the center there and some faces come up. And you have to report when a face reoccurs after a gap of, of one different face. So there's a face, there's another face. That one wasn't like the previous one. Okay, there's another one. Let's check another one. Okay, that one reoccurred again. So that actually requires, that's a much more complicated task that requires working memory to, to sort of like, you have to remember what you're supposed to do, which is sort of press the button when you see the face repeat after a delay of two. Uh, and then you have to sort of keep the different faces in mind and they keep changing around and it's, it, it's a much more hard, hard task to do. If you do that task, what happens is you get a lot of activity in the frontal cortex, which is part of the cortex that's actually involved in sort of like controlling behavior and planning things and, and, and movements. But it turns out there's actually maps very similar to the kinds of maps that we saw in visual areas uh, in frontal cortex as well. So there's a lot of maps in frontal cortex uh, as well and they represent objects that you're doing a task on in different parts of the world. And this makes a certain amount of sense because usually if something is going on, it's not happening in exactly the same place in the world as something else. Uh, it's relatively rare when two people occupy the exact same part of space. It's usually a bad thing if that happens. Uh, so this is, um, this is kind of a summary of many experiments uh, put together showing a large number of different maps with a bunch of uh, acronyms that you don't have to worry about. Uh, but there's a large number of these and they look pretty much, uh, pretty much in their basic layout to what we already knew from other primates. Um, now, I've spent a lot of my, uh, my research career studying the visual system, but 
it turns out that there are maps and other modalities, and I want to just briefly go through uh, two examples. One is a higher level map uh, in, the, in the somatosensory system, and then an auditory map. So this is a picture of, of a rat somatosensory cortex, or touch cortex, and you can see all these little spots here. But these spots represent, each one of these spots represents one whisker. That's one whisker and another whisker and another whisker. That's actually the head of the rat there with all its rows of whiskers. And then this is the hand of the rat right here. These little things are the little pads on the, on the rat, rat paw. And then that's his back leg over there. So there's actually a map of the entire rat in the rat brain. And there's, a, there's maps of your entire body in your brain. Actually, there's probably in the order of eight maps of your entire body. So what we, and here's an example from a, from a monkey. These are the actual representations of the individual fingers in the cortex. This is, these, these are parts of the mouth, and the foot is, foot is over there. Uh, so what we did is we devised this fearsome apparatus. It, it's, it's actually much more pleasant than it looks. Uh, <coughs> so what it does is it, it, it blasts little puffs of, of gentle air onto different parts of your face. So it just feels like a little cool breeze that's sort of touching different parts of your, uh, of your face. And what we discovered with this was that there's actually a map of the face, but it's a more complicated, higher level map of the face. So here it is up here. This is, this is part of parietal cortex. Uh, if you zoom in on it, this is sort of the upper part of the face and the lower part of the face and kind of like near the eye. But the interesting thing about this map is it actually combines information from different modalities. So this is right at the boundary between the representation of touch and the representation of vision. And if you actually show somebody a picture in there, you can see that upper parts of the, of the picture or, or of a little video activate the same part of the cortex as air puffs on the upper part of the forehead. So this area is actually combining information about, about vision and touches. And it's not uncommon that you have to combine that sort of information. For instance, when you eat every day, you pick some food up and it has to go in your mouth. You don't want to sort of have it, you know, miss. And <clears throat> part of the reason it goes in your mouth is you actually see it. Uh, and, and this area is very likely involved in sort of coordinating movements of the hand and the, and the head and coordinating and, and making sure your head doesn't hit a door frame when you go through. So it's a very important area every day. The interesting thing about it is that we have maps even right up at the very top of the system where the modalities are coming together. We still have maps. Uh, now, it's relatively rare to get information from modalities mixing, uh, going back to that common sense idea. Uh, and this is, there's, there's a relatively small area between this huge stretch of visual areas back here and some somatosensory areas by, uh, back there. But just right at the boundary, you, you have this mixing going on in the higher level area, uh, but still sort of using a map motif. Now, if you actually look at the auditory system, we see the same thing. What's, what's represented in the auditory system is the frequency or the pitch of a sound. So what was done here is that, and I'll show it to you unfolded so you can see it a little easier. Red stands for high pitches. So this is, it sort of sounds something like So you can see again, multiple representations of different pitches uh, spread out on the auditory cortex. Now I didn't really talk about the motor system at all, which is another major part of the brain. Uh, but you can see this is a picture of the cerebellum, and once again, the cerebellum has its own little cortex, uh, finely folded surface like this, and it's connected up to things like the strangely entitled inferior olive. If you look closely, you can see there's this little sort of snake-like surface in there. It's another little cortex sort of jammed into the inferior olive, hooked up to this, this, this giant folded up surface. And so the map kind of motif is present throughout the brain. It's kind of like, it's, it's, it's the way that the brain does stuff, even in the motor system for programming different movements. Okay, so what can we sort of come back to this and sort of conclude? Well, I think, you know, this picture, this picture is wrong uh, in that basically the modalities do not mix at the front. Uh, they pretty much stay separated and they, they, they mix sort of in the motor system and at the very boundaries between them. Uh, but it still leaves us with the problem. Uh, since the, the, the organization of the human brain basically looks relatively similar to these monkey brains, like, what's the difference? There's some difference. What's, the, what's actually causing the difference? And so that's what you all came for. So now we're going to move to a more speculative part of the talk. And uh, 
really uh, talk about two new, different ways of thinking about how language might have evolved. And I, I'm sort of like, I'm sort of going back to uh, a motif that Darwin talked about a lot, which is this idea of pre-adaptation. So when, when Darwin was looking at all these different uh, animals and the structure of different animals, one thing he often pointed out is that he'd see a structure in one kind of animal, and you see an, another structure in a different animal, and, and that, uh, that structure would have been somehow adapted to a different use. And of course, the best example is, is, is wings. So how do animals fly? Well, they fly with their arms. Were arms developed for flying? No, they are actually developed originally in fishes for sort of scrabbling around on the bottom of, the, uh, on the bottom of shallow seas. And then eventually fishes came out of the, out of the water and then they, they used their arms in the air. And then when they went into the air, they used the arms uh, in the air but sort of like walking around on the land. Uh, and then when they went into the air, they used their arms for that, but arms were not originally developed for wings. And that came secondarily. They just happened to be lying around and seemed like a pretty good thing to turn into a wing. So that's the kind of sort of, um, uh, we're going to try to sort of give two examples of, of two things that might have led to pre-adaptations for, uh, for language, for peculiarly human language. Uh, now, when people think about the origin of language, uh, they often sort of think about it uh, with something I've called uh, sort of a scenario that I've called the semantic urge. And, 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 and the picture here is that you have sort of, you know, Gronk, the Australopithecine, out on the savanna, and it's starting to rain, and, it, and primates and, and chimpanzees, they don't like it when it rains too much. And so he's looking over at another Australopithecine, and he has this urge to tell the other guy, like, you know, we should really make like a little lean-to or something to get out of the rain. It would, uh, but he has no way of, of controlling his organs of vocalization. And so he's sort of like sitting there with this urge to communicate something uh, to this other Australopithecine. And then the idea is that over time, eventually, this drove the, um, the evolution of the vocalization apparatus to give it sort of more fine fine-grained control. Now, it's very common when people sort of think about, think about how language must have, must have uh, gotten off the, off the ground. I think it's, I think it's probably uh, uh, completely wrong uh, for the following reason. If we, if we actually look at other examples of very fine-grained vocal behavior, uh, we find that they, uh, they, have a, they have a strange relationship to vocal behavior that all, that all vertebrates essentially have. So when you go back to this, to this no notion of having the urge to, to tell another animal some meaning, people often assume that animals don't do that. And that's actually, that's actually not correct. So if you take, a, if you take a, a chicken and pinch it, it will sort of squawk. Uh, it's trying to tell you, like, that hurt, don't do that. Uh, if you actually fly a little shadow that looks like a hawk over a chicken, a chicken will give a different kind of sound, a very specific sound, that indicates there's a dangerous thing overhead. If you play that sound to another chicken, uh, the other chicken will get very nervous and immediately sort of like try to get under some, some bushes someplace to sort of avoid the hawk. So animals already have a set of alarm calls that are meaningful, that have semantics. They refer to things out in the world, like dangerous things flying overhead. And you probably have heard that monkeys have alarm calls. They have sort of an alarm call for stuff, the dangerous like snake in the grass kind of alarm call as opposed to aerial predator alarm call. They also have calls to sort of affiliate with other, other animals to sort of indicate there's, there's a macaque over here and it's, it's a good thing, it's a good place for macaques, you ought to come over here. Uh, so there's, they, have, they have several s sets of calls like that. Uh, when we look, but the problem with these, these kinds of calls in terms of thinking of them as a predecessor of language is that they're not learned. Uh, so if, if an animal is deaf, it will still develop all these calls. And we know that certainly if, if a human is deafened, they will not develop auditory spoken language in the same way as, as somebody who can hear. So uh, they're, they're, they're kind of hardwired and, and instinctive. When we actually look at the completely separately wired set of vocal behaviors that look more like language, we see things like birdsong. So this is, this is a, um, 
is a canary bird song. And if you just, uh, if you just play it, it sounds like that. So if I, if I back up again and play it, just listen for the little twitter right here. Precise little, little bird song. Turns out that these bird songs are, are actually learned, very much like languages learned, very precisely. And the way that the birds learn them is they listen to other birds singing, typically the father bird or the mother bird, and they don't actually generate any sound for several months. And then when they start to generate sound, they sort of babble, kind of like babies do. They generate sort of little incorrect twitters, and then they remember, actually. You don't have to, they don't have to hear the sound anymore. They actually remember what it's supposed to sound like, and they slowly hone their output until it precisely matches their memory of what, of what the bird song was like. And uh, it turns out there's accents. So for instance, if you take a Santa Barbara zebra finch and play it some tapes of you know, San Francisco zebra finches, it sort of comes out with the San Francisco accent. So these things are actually culturally transmitted by the birds. They're not genetic, and they require learning. And there's sort of a, a critical period where the song eventually gets, uh, gets stabilized. Um, now, if I play that backwards, uh, so that, that's forward. OK, but now I'm sort of playing it forward and backwards. It doesn't sound like much to you, probably, unless you're a real bird song aficionado. It just sounds like some twittering. Yeah, it's just, it happens in the morning, doesn't it? <clears throat> Let's just try that with, with speech. So here's some speech. Speech sort of operates at about the same speed as bird song. So here's a... Hi, this is Steve Jobs. Uh, that was the little file that came on my old Next computer when I got it many years ago. <laughs> now, if I play that backwards, it definitely doesn't sound right. This is Steve Jobs. Oh, I need to the Yeah, so, so that, that, that's uh, clearly, not, uh, <clears throat> uh, clearly not right compared to the bird song. So, um, so what, is the, uh, what is the point of that? Well, it turns out that birds, I just showed you one song. Some birds have a thousand of these songs. A thousand of the, they, they know a thousand different precise songs, precisely accented. And if you wake up in the morning, sometimes you can hear a single bird out there just, just powering away through, you know, tens, twenties, fifties of these. They have a very cute thing in some wrens where both the male and the female sing, where the, 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 the female will sing a duet that exactly follows the male. Now, so that with just a, a delay of about 200 milliseconds, so just exactly copying whatever song the male is singing. So what is the general evolutionary biology theory for where that came from? Uh, the theory is that it, it, it's sort of like this, this guy. This is a mandrill. Um, and uh, there he is close up. He's got sort of some serious makeup on, sort of like this big uh, red thing, and then the blue, really pretty blue thing, nice whiskers, uh, and very sort of like fierce looking eyes up there. Um, so where did this come from? Well, this. This kind of sort of coloration troubled Darwin greatly uh, because he couldn't figure out how something like this could have come about by natural selection. Selection means sort of breeding. So natural selection was kind of like the, the naturally occurring animal breeding that was going on in the wild all the time, which presumably was mostly going on as a result of, of uh, sort of having better legs or better teeth or better wings. Uh, but this, he eventually sort of came up with this idea called sexual selection, which is selection that's based on what the opposite sex likes. Now that not, might not necessarily be a really practical thing. And you can see many examples in the animal world where, uh, where various kinds of makeup has been applied either to the male or the female uh, because the, either the, the female or the male liked it better and mated more with the people, sorry, with the animals who had that. Uh, <laughs> had those properties, and so, you, so, so essentially the perception of the mate's visual system is driving some aspect of evolution. Uh, now, if you've ever been to the zoo and seen these funny looking things, sort of tumor-like things, uh, some, a lot of times people you know, are wondering, is the animal sort of well? Uh, that's actually very, very much prized by the, by the, by the male baboons. Uh, so that's a little sexual swelling that just happens uh, during one part of the month. It's kind of inconvenient. You, you can sort of see it's sort of right where you sit, more or less. But, uh, uh, but there's many other examples of this. So this is an, an Irish elk, which is actually a deer, despite its, its name. Uh, it had these 12-foot-wide antlers. 
Uh, now, what are the antlers used for? Well, they are used a little bit for fighting. So here's some elks sort of fighting, but you can see they're not exactly the most practical fighting weapon. They're made out of bone, and you can snap them. And so, they, so there's these sort of embarrassing fights where these two elks come together and they kind of like, like try not to snap their antlers off while they sort of like wrestle around. A lot of times the cameras focus on this, but what they should be focusing on is the female elkies off in the, off in the side watching this. And they're sort of checking them, you know, like uh, checking out that guy. Is he symmetrical and he has really big horns? Yeah. That's what's actually driving the evolution of these things. Now, we have another very interesting parallel example of the evolution of control of vocal behavior, which is uh, in whales. So whales sing these songs. You've probably heard them. You thought like, you know, you can see these guys are kind of having fun. So you probably thought they're just like, you know, they're just sort of mooing and making all these random noises. Uh, but um, if you actually speed it up a little bit, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quadruple the speed so you can hear it. And what's happened is, is the whale is singing a, something that's very much like a bird song twice. So you'll be going through the, you'll be going through the song twice. So, so listen to this. Uh, start again. Then there's that toilet flushing sound. Uh, that, that's, that's actually a whale making that really complicated sound. So they very precisely generate these songs one, one, after the, uh, one after the other. If you speed it up in pitch, if you sort of raise the pitch, uh, then it sounds... It, it sounds, kind of sounds like bird song. Part of the problem is they have such an echoplex machine in the, uh, under the water, they have to go slower so that the, uh, so the females can hear it. Now, what is, on earth does this have to do with language? Uh, well. My idea is basically that language initially, that, that the vocal control part of language initially got started because males and females just liked the way it sounded, with no meaning at all. And when you actually look at the meaning of bird song or the meaning of whale song, it's way less than the meaning of an alarm call that a chicken makes even though the actual sort of subtlety and sort of motor control needed to make a bird song or make a whale song is, is quite substantial. It involves learning, uh, cultural transmission of all these very precise things. But it's, it's generally thought to be an example of sexual selection. So that what the, the reason that birds have all this complicated motor control isn't because they have anything to say. It's just because the females or the males liked those little complicated little filigree kind of things. And they mated with the guys that had sort of more complicated filigree things. So it's very strange, but it's a very clear example in birds. Not all birds uh, have bird song. Only a couple families out of the, the whole collection of birds actually have bird song. But it shows you that you can actually drive the evolution of complicated vocal learning, uh, vocal, uh, vocal control, neural vocal control, without actually having to have any meaning uh, associated with it. And I think that's a much more likely pre-adaptation for language than kind of the semantic urge idea where you had this urge to kind of like tell, you know, Gronk the other Australopithecine we should make a lean-to uh, idea. That I think there's probably a much longer period of evolution uh, during the period of Homo erectus where you eventually develop some of the neural control over the larynx and breathing and the tongue and lips and all the coordination required to do exactly what I'm doing right now, which is generating somewhere on the order of 10 to, to 15 little pops and clicks and little precise sounds per second for hours on end. So, <laughs> so uh, you could say, well, is that really reasonable? I, I, it's, we have two examples of it in the animal world uh, where basically this vocal control evolved for sexual selection reasons and not for actually carrying any meaning at all. Uh, when you actually look at a chimpanzee, you can see chimpanzees are spectacularly bad at vocal control. So chimpanzees, you can easily train a chimpanzee to say press a button that has a little plus on it when he sees a ball, like associate a symbol with a ball, but it's, it's impossible to train a chimpanzee to actually 
to actually make a particular sound in response to seeing a ball, whereas a songbird can easily be trained to do something like that, or a parrot, for instance. Chimpanzees can sort of like go, ooh, 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 ooh. that's a pant hoot, where you sort of go in and out like that. But they generally do that in sort of emotion-laden situations. And to some extent, the emotion-ladenness of alarm calls gets in the way. Because the problem is, language isn't like that. Language is like what I'm doing now, it's just blah, 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 blah. Yeah, he's just talking and talking, and we're, we're, not, we're not too upset about it, you know, we're not getting that angry, just like blah, blah, blah. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of like detached from emotion, the actual, and that's very similar to what happens in a songbird. The actual details of what the songbird sings are kind of detached from emotion. They're just random variation that the females or the males like to, like to hear. Um, so I think it's a, it's a strange source for language, sort of like developing the ability to speak before you actually have any, anything to say, but I think it's actually much better supported by looking at the evolution of vocal behavior uh, in other animals. Okay, so uh, we're sort of getting to the end. We have to get some meaning in there someplace because obviously that's what language is for, is for communicating meaning. Now, how do you sort of communicate meaning? Well, you communicate meaning by basically putting words together. So you put words into a long series. Uh, you, if you just say floor, that doesn't really sort of have a lot of meaning. You need to sort of have multiple words uh, in a row and you need to be able to sort of combine these words. And so what possible pre-adaptation for combining meanings uh, could we point to? And the one that I want to point to is something that you, you, you take for granted because your visual system is so good. So uh, it turns out that when you look, when you come into a room and look around, what does it feel like? You walk into the room, you look around, there's a chair there and a table and so what? It sort of seems, seems like everything is just sort of sitting, sitting there in the scene. Uh, but that's not anything remotely like what's coming into your visual system. What's actually coming into your visual system looks a little bit like this. So this is a person's face, and you're looking first at the right ear of the person, then you look at his nose, and then the left ear, and then back at the nose and the right ear. So this is, the, this is the, the strange movie that is playing on your visual cortex all the time. Whenever you look at something or, so, or somebody, whatever you're exactly looking at blows up enormously. So if you look at their nose, they'll have a really big nose. If you look at their eye, they'll have a huge sort of like, you know, bloodshot eye uh, or a, a giant ear. So the strange sort of reality of the visual system from which you, re you reconstruct and construct this static feeling of stuff out there uh, is this sequence of glances. Now, typical glances are usually like you, you make several glances a second. So there's kind of like a rapid fire of glance, 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 as you come into a room. And somehow you actually assemble that series of glances into a meaningful, coherent representation of the room. A monkey needs to do this too. And what does a monkey do with that sort of assembled scene? Well, they decide what to do next. Like, okay, Bill the monkey came in there. He seems pretty friendly now. I look, there's Jill the monkey. She's also kind of friendly. Bill's looking over at Jill. Uh, not too many eagles around. Okay, I'll just sit here. So, you know, sometimes you might do nothing. Uh, but if something comes up, you know, perhaps a, a leopard comes along or maybe there's an eagle or Maybe you just get tired and a little hungry and you want to go off and, and pick up a little blade of grass someplace. Uh, you have to actually decide what to do on the basis of all the variable situations in the current scene. And often you have to sort of attach together information that occurred a long distance away. So for instance, if I look at Bill the monkey, and then I look over at Jill, and then I look at the tree, and then I sort of look at my fingernails and just, uh, just sort of sit there for a while. And then I look back at Bill to see, for instance, whether Bill has, has gotten more mad or, or more, more glad than he was last time, your visual system has this problem of sort of like, I saw Bill like seven glances ago and now I'm seeing him again. Is, is he sort of look the same? So it has to sort of tie information together over time. You don't realize how serial your visual system is. Uh, it works so well and so effortlessly and the world sort of seems to stay stationary out there in spite of the fact that it's kind of like wobbling all around all the time that you just, it's, 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 it's something, it's so good at doing its job, it's, it's, you don't even notice. Um, so I would like to draw on that kind of 
a pre-adaptation that is something that a monkey would do as the source of the meaning assembly part of language. So if you, if you actually look at, at filmmaking, filmmakers have to sort of respect some of the simple syntax of what glances can come in which order. So for instance, if we're filming a two people talking to each other, we generally sort of rotate the camera back and forth between the two people so it looks like people are talking to each other. So an example, and we don't sort of put the camera on the other side of those two people. So for instance, if there's Claudia saying, uh, I wonder why Marty has all those little spots on his face. And, uh, and Marty says, well, you know, I was doing this experiment. And so you go back and forth and it sort of seems like two people talking to each other. Now, by contrast, if I put the camera on the other side, it just sort of looks like Claudia turns into Marty. That's not sort of, that doesn't look quite right, you know, different shaped jaw, et cetera. <laughs> So these, so filmmakers know that generally what happens is you can slowly track a camera like somebody walking, and you can rotate a camera rapidly like your saccade, your, your eye making a saccade, but you generally don't just like translate the camera randomly somewhere else, at least until you sort of like go into the next scene. So, so my th general theory for where the meaningful aspect of, of language uh, came from uh, was that at the very last second, it got attached onto this pre-existing vocal control system that developed for other reasons that had nothing to do with meaning. So, so that, see, the idea is that we have two major pre-adaptations. This is my only slide with lots of uh, text on it. So we have this initial period of vocal control, gaining vocal control by sexual selection, and generally, you know, sort of, for the good of society, for the good of hominid societies, even though they had nothing to say. Uh, I mean, the other thing to sort of consider is, is musical ability, which is also sort of strange, strangely good in humans. And it sort of serves to sort of bring people together. It doesn't directly communicate meanings, but it, it must be partly related to the abilities, the auditory vocal abilities uh, that are also used for speech. The second pre-adaptation is something that, that essentially all animals have to do. Even if, they're, even if they're blind, they would do it with their auditory system or their touch, or like Helen Keller did with her, with her fingers by touching things in sequence. And so the second pre-adaptation is basically something that all animals have to do. They have to assemble scenes by bonding together a sequence of glances, whether it's from the visual system or it's from touching things in order or it's from hearing things in order. Uh, and when we talk about sort of uh, language evolution, a lot of times people assume there must be just some language gene or there must be some little language area and that sort of does everything that sort of makes us more languagey than the other, uh, the other animals and that sort of like accounts for all the extra power. Uh, I think that's, that, that's not how brains evolve. Uh, when we look at brains, what we find is that we can get a few more visual areas and we can get a few more auditory areas, but you know, we still have the globus pallidus and we still have the substantia nigra and we still have the pulvinar and 400 other parts of the brain that you can find in a rat. And so the, the, the actual brain circuitry is exceedingly conservative. And especially at UCSD, we like to sort of think about the evolution of language as something that, that really built on pre-existing things and slightly tweaked it as opposed to, uh, as opposed to just in sort of like a, a Big Bang theory, as the late Liz Bates used to say, of, of language, where it just sort of comes into existence and sort of like a meteorite and hits Wernicke's area and then suddenly you have language. So this, um, this additional power of being able to sort of evoke fictive scenes that happened in the past or that haven't happened yet but you would like to happen, like making the lean-to, gives you tremendous cognitive power because it allows you to talk about things that happened before. It allows you to discuss things, uh, discuss that you're upset or discuss that you used to be upset, but you're not upset, but you might get upset if something else happens. And all the important things um, that language is used for, that gives you tremendous power to sort of organize humans together, whereas animals are kind of stuck with the current scene much more as far as their visual scene assembly apparatus goes. Now, this doesn't mean that, that other animals don't have memory, they do. I mean, a, a squirrel can bury nuts and find most of them, like 80%, which is pretty good, given how many they bury. Uh, birds can, birds do the, caching birds do the same thing. They'll bury 
they'll hide little things and go back and find them. And they've actually experimentally measured this. A year later, a bird or a squirrel can find something that, that, it, that it stored. So it's not memory, per se. I'm not saying that animals don't have memory. I'm saying that they don't have a productive way of attaching up a symbol stream to this visual scene assembler that they otherwise just use for assembling the current visual scene. And so the, so the theory is, is basically that this, this final stage just requires some more rapid way of allowing auditory symbols, which didn't mean anything, were evolved for, for essentially meaninglessness and just sort of because they sounded good, essentially attaching them up to the higher level parts of the visual system uh, where this, this scene assembly process goes on normally with respect to the current scene. So, so that's, that's my theory, and I think I'm just about done. I've had a lot of collaborators over the years, and, and uh, there's uh, quite, quite the long list of them. And I thank you very much for coming and packing into the auditorium. <laughs>